Hi, Lauren. Um, I get very nervous, but I'll try to ask my question. Um, you talk about awareness expressing itself to us through truth, beauty, and love. And many times I hear you give examples of how that expression can be in beauty and love, like love for a child or love for another person or poetry or music. Can you talk a little bit about how it would express itself or how we can express it um, through understanding? And the reason I ask this is um, one, of, one of my first loves was mathematics and that's what I studied and it's still one of my first love. Um, and also physical science. And even though I've come to start it, I've, I'm starting to be very suspicious of material science, not mathematics, but um, like I get interested in physics and the philosophy of time. Are those things, what are ways, are those ways to have thought you know, be an expression of awareness? Yes, if, as long as you go far enough with those thoughts, to, for instance, to, to, if you were to investigate the nature of time, yes, if you, if you took that investigation far enough, it would take you back to your true nature. Actually, if you investigate anything far enough, it will take you back to your true nature because everything arises from awareness. And therefore, if, if you follow any, anything, literally anything, any experience can be a pathway back to your true nature. The, 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 uh, this, this afternoon, my time, uh, uh, the, our, first, our first session, we, we were doing just that with, with our emotions. The feeling of jealousy or sorrow or shame or guilt or fear, any, any of these things. That was exactly what we were doing. We, we were surfing our feelings back to the shore of awareness. So if for you it's more, um, you're more cerebral, you like to think, then yes, then then think about the nature of time or the nature of matter or the nature of the mind or any of these questions if you if you pursue them deeply enough they'll take you to reality thank you and one very one quick question um what would you say is something like the physical law physical laws just say gravity for instance would that would you think of that as something like another filtering of our mind, the way perceptions well, are? It, it, in the ultimate analysis, Lauren, I, I would suggest that there are no physical things. I, I would say, um, like, like the physicist um, James genes he said the universe is a great activity it is not a great entity uh, mm -hmm. i would i would agree the universe is a great activity in consciousness not an entity made out of matter matter is just what that activity looks like when perceived from a localized perspective so ultimately the laws of that, that govern matter are, are really not laws that, that govern the, the behavior of matter. They're laws that govern the behavior of mind, the activity of mind. There are still, there can still be laws that govern the behavior of mind. M mind um, behaves in habitual or repetitive ways. We all know that. So th there are patterns to the way in which the universal mind behaves that's why the universe is looks appears much the same to us every day 
because it, it, its patterns of behavior are, are stable and there are laws that govern those patterns of behavior and the laws of gravity would be one such law. It's just that the law of gravity in this interpretation would not be, a, ultimately would not be a law that governs the behavior of matter. It would be a law that governs the behavior of mind. But it is, it's, so it's an appearance. It appears to be a certain way, even if there's ultimately nothing. Well, it appears to be a certain way, depending on the location from which it is viewed. Okay. Everything appears the way it does, depending on the location from which it is viewed. So the, the observer and the observed are, are, are two aspects. The, well, what I mean by the observer, the localized observer and the observed are, are two aspects of the same reality. What we see is that, I think I mentioned it earlier, what we see as the, as the universe is what the activity of infinite consciousness looks like from a localized perspective. And this is not such a far out idea. If you think about what takes place when you have a dream at night, where, where are you speaking from, Lauren? I'm uh, by Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Well, okay, so you, you fall asleep in Philadelphia and you have a dream that you're visiting London and you're walking on the streets of London. Now, the, the dream, the streets of London in your dream are entirely the activity of your own mind. There's nothing there apart from the activity of your mind, yes? However, you cannot view the streets of London directly from your bed in Philadelphia. Your mind has to forget itself or overlook itself. It has to enter into its own dream localize itself within its own dream as an apparently separate subject of experience on the streets of London. Now, from the perspective of that apparently separate subject of experience on the streets of London, that the streets of London look as if they're made out of matter. Why? But that's how they look from the perspective of your localized mind. You wake up in the morning and you realize, oh no, the streets of London weren't made out of matter. It was all the activity of my mind. My own mind divided itself in two. The dream was the activity of my mind, but the only way I could see the activity of my mind was localizing myself within that activity. Likewise, God cannot see or infinite consciousness cannot see the universe directly. It can only do so from a localized perspective. And from a localized perspective, we, each localized mind filters reality through its own limitations. And we, what we see of the world is, a, is an objectivization of the limitations of our own mind. What we're seeing out there is only infinite consciousness. It's God's face. There's nothing else there. It's the activity of infinite consciousness. When it's filtered through the prism of a human mind, it appears as the world we know. 